All right, good afternoon. Everybody, take a seat, any seat. Thank you very much. My pleasure to welcome you to the real Final Four. The other one is just a pretender. Uh, I just want to talk a bit about the rules. So first of all, just a regular thing. If you've got cell phones, put them on stun. Don't respond to them. We want to keep this so we're very courteous to the presenters. If you leave and it has to be an emergency, then you can't get back in till the first round is finished. All right? So every 35 minutes you can get in. Anyone who comes now cannot get into the auditorium, just so we keep no distractions uh, going on. We're running this the same as we ran the first round. It's 20 minutes for the presenters, 15 minutes for questions. We have a timer and we'll stick to that schedule very closely. Now it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, an esteemed group of judges from Erickson, the final round judges. First one's Helena Norman, Senior Vice President of Communications. Right now? Right. And in the middle is Arun Brikshay Shavaran. He is Vice President, or she says Chief Marketing Officer. Right. We want to get that right. Okay. And third is uh, Eraldo Salas Cavalcante. He's Executive Development Program Director. And thank you very much for doing this. And we will call the first team up. Ladies and gentlemen. and even corporations. In education, collaboration holds the promise of reforming a static and sterile institution. People talking about how we need so many percentage college graduates. The President of the United States wants to have more college graduates. You mean you want more people who are very good at sitting still for a while, then partying later at night, and then cramming information in their head so they can pass an exam and then forget it later? In business, collaborative solutions can drive down inefficiency and speed time to market, but few have succeeded in this endeavor. The question becomes, how do we bring traditional institutions into the network society and drive the next generation of innovation and development? So these are certainly daunting challenges, but the solution is close at hand. Good afternoon. We're Team Sao Paulo, and we'd like to share with you today our vision for a network society. Now, in considering where Ericsson's position will be in this network society, we've come to the conclusion that by leveraging its global scale, its services and technology leadership, that Ericsson can deliver on the vision of a network society. That by creating a ecosystem with partners around the world, that Ericsson can revolutionize the global educational system. And by offering the strength of the network society to the enterprise, Ericsson can transform the way that businesses collaborate and the way that they innovate. Now, considering what this new model, what this new vision of a network society will look like, we drew inspiration from the growing machine-to-machine -machine ecosystem, and specifically the role that Ericsson is currently playing in it. These are all various industries that are looking for M2M &M solutions. But the average revenue per user is very low, and this, and this industry and this technology needs scale to be successful. Ericsson is going to play the hub in between all of these players and create an ecosystem that drives innovation and achieves scale. Now, what if we apply this same concept? What if we apply the same vision to education, where, again, Ericsson sits at the hub? teachers, students, institutions, startup companies, nonprofit organizations. And by leveraging all of its strengths in infrastructure, services, thought leadership, 
can create the Ericsson empowered ecosystem. And this is just not, not just an opportunity to revolutionize education. This is not just an opportunity to create a sustainable business model. This is an opportunity for Ericsson to get that much closer to their customers and to really brand themselves strongly across the world. Now, looking closer at the education, at the global educational sector, the technology has been there for quite some time to really be able to make these changes. And the need is certainly there across the world. But why hasn't the revolution happened yet? And if we look at the inhibiting factors, what we see is there are players out there who can address these issues one-on-one, -on -one, maybe a couple of them. But really what we're seeing, similar to the M2M industry, is that you have low ARPU and you have various individual players who might be able to resolve some of these issues. But you need an ecosystem. You need a collaborative environment. You need scale to really deliver on the next generation of education. Now looking at some of the key partnerships that Ericsson should enter into to develop this ecosystem. They'll vary around the world. Some players will be global, some will be regional, some will be local. But you'll part Ericsson should partner with startups to drive innovation, get fresh new ideas. It's just, they should partner with nonprofit organizations such as Teachers Without Borders to get te the teaching expertise and distribution channels access to developing markets, the content providers, educational software creators, and transaction brokers. And at the center of all of this, Ericsson collaborates, Ericsson coordinates, Ericsson provides and fosters this ecosystem. They provide the infrastructure, they offer the scale, and they offer analytics on all the data coming through the network that helps educators learn how to teach their students better, that, her, that helps content providers learn how to adapt their curriculums based on how students are using them. Now, how do we see this work out in practice? On the top, you have a school somewhere in the US. On the bottom, you have a school somewhere in a developing country. They follow a similar pattern. The government funds the school, the school pays the teacher, the teacher educates the children. But they might have very different problems. There might be a teacher in the US who is going through budget cuts and is trying to do more with less. And maybe she can learn something from a teacher in a developing country who's been doing so for years. And maybe that same teacher in a developing country needs access to better curriculum. By inserting the Ericsson empowered ecosystem in the middle of this, there's a global knowledge marketplace to transfer ideas, to transfer content, and to really enable the growth and education of our global society. Imagine the possibilities. A high school student in America wants to make some extra money over the summer, so he partners with a startup in this ecosystem to deliver a tutoring to another city in the US or maybe another country. The possibilities are endless. And this also provides a marketplace through which transactions can be brokered, which means that it's not going to be reliant on government funding leading to a sustainable, profitable business model, as we'll see in a moment. Now let's take a look at some of the market opportunities in this industry. One of the market opportunities that we identified is a strong market opportunity at the base of the pyramid. At the base of the pyramid, there's a four billion person untapped market that Ericsson can go into. Additionally, we look specifically at Asia, and the reason being that there's a $28.3 billion ICT untapped market in the base of the pyramid there, again for Ericsson to walk into. For this particular example of Ericsson Empowered Education Networks, we've identified Cambodia as being one of the places to start off for two particular reasons. Firstly, Cambodia is in dire need of educational resources. But secondly, more critical to Ericsson is that there's a latent demand for ICT in the base of the pyramid in Cambodia. We analyzed the different spending patterns at the base of the pyramid and we've identified that at the higher income level of the base, there's a disproportionate amount of spending on ICT. Additionally, in Cambodia, mid-market households spend about 12 times as much as base of the pyramid households on ICT. This tells us that there is a demand and there's an opportunity here for Ericsson to move into. Now, I wanna to talk to you all a little bit about a little girl called Milena and her brother, Sina. I met Milena when I was traveling abroad in Cambodia and I was impressed I was impressed by her thirst for knowledge. I was impressed 
by her curiosity of the world and how much she really wanted to learn. As impressed as I was with her curiosity, though, I was equally disappointed in the educational resources that were afforded to her in her village. There was a lack of curriculum development. There was a lack of resources at the school, books, whiteboards. What can an Erickson-empowered system do for Milena? It gives her a global reach. It enables her to share ideas, insights, and innovation with people across the world, and students across America, students across Africa, and students across Asia. Additionally, it gives her access to a network of teachers to enable her to learn things that she never could have done before. And finally, it gives her access to nonprofit organizations that will give her resources to be able to learn on her own in her village, giving her the opportunity to pull herself out of poverty and into prosperity. But it's not just Milena that gains out of this ecosystem. In fact, there's a whole host of stakeholders that will benefit. Stakeholders such as the teachers in the schools, Cambodia itself and the surrounding region, and finally Ericsson and its partners. Students, the teachers in the schools will benefit from having a global access to the different education markets around the world and the ability to develop truly innovative curriculums. Cambodia itself will have an increased digital literacy rate and an increased adoption in technology. And studies have shown that increased adoption in technology actually leads to a higher per capita GDP rate growth, especially in developing countries. Lastly, for Ericsson, Ericsson gains a foothold in low and middle income economies, which are quickly catching up to high income economies. Furthermore, Ericsson gets the opportunity to pilot business models in a low risk situation. Now we talked about this business model in Asia and in Cambodia, but the beautiful thing about it is that it's a business model that is sustainable and transferable across the world. The prices of the services are determined per student depending on the services that are offered and where it is being sold and provided. The partners that are in the ecosystem share in the profits, the costs, and the revenue, enabling reinvestment into the ecosystem, not only in content, but also in infrastructure, making this ecosystem grow over time and becoming more powerful. Our financial projections out to 2015 show that Ericsson breaks even in Cambodia by year three. And after that, there's a non-linear revenue growth this is for a developing country. Imagine what that would be like for a developed country or a high income economy. Ericsson, with its key partnerships, is in a competitive position to launch the Ericsson Empowered Educational Initiative. It's the best way to share ideas, to share insight, and to share innovation to create true impact across the world. As Christian discussed, the Ericsson Empowered Network can really drive innovation on a global scale over a number of different industries, in this case, education. However, it will become increasingly important for Ericsson to look internally and how Ericsson can level, leverage the Ericsson Empowered Network internally to drive its relationships between customers, partners, employees, managers, internal networks, external networks, in order to create a highly collaborative and highly dynamic industry that can respond to all their customer needs. The problems are the same in, as for uh, the internal networks as they are for education. The technology is there. The tools are there. They are the right tools, but things that are holding them back are the proliferation of those tools. And how do you bring them all into the organization? And how do you bring them all in in time and at low cost? All the integration costs are, creating, uh, uh, are making it unjustifiable for a solution that's supposed to save you time and make you more productive. The second issue is with all these tools, you have multiple interfaces and multiple ways for these services to interact. That creates user confusion, that disrupts the flow of inf information, and again, destroys the purpose of an open and collaborative platform. Third, there's a cultural shift on the individual level, but not at the enterprise. Individuals are adopting social networks and social networking tools at an unprecedented rate. Facebook, Twitter, other collaboration tools are being used in their personal lives, but once they step in the office, they're never used again. And this problem is twofold. One is from the hierarchical structure that says, you need to do your work this way. And the other is from the user side that says, I don't know how to use these tools, so I'm gonna stick to my old ways of doing things. And lastly, on, on our problem slide here, 
is looking at the security and IP issues. Sure, the idea of having a free exchange of ideas and innovation is a great idea, unless, you're, unless your ideas freely walk out the door. Now, you need to look at how you keep these things indoors, and as you're developing this innovation environment, how you protect your ideas through IP and who owns that. So how does Ericsson look at this and create that innovative culture and create that culture of collaboration? It starts from the top. There needs to be a leadership directive across the enterprise, across every single unit, across every single region, that this is the mandated priority, that these goals are in line with the company's values to create a collaborative community. Now, there are six principles on this page, but we want to touch on three major ones. The first one is developing more transparency. In order to have a proper collaborative network, users need to trust that the system works. And the only way that works is that the system is completely transparent and that users do not feel at risk of being uh, penalized for any of the ideas that they propose. Whether it's a good idea, bad idea, middle of the road, provocative idea, they know that they can propose these ideas freely and it's an open exchange of thought leadership. Second, any innovative culture needs to engage with failure. You cannot succeed in an innovative environment unless you're willing to fail over and over and over again. Third, you need to look at the enabling technologies. Ericsson cannot and should not build all these tools on their own. They need to leverage the outside innovation as well to take a fresh look at how these outside tools can help their organization and how they can really power the next generation of collaborative technologies. So looking at our execution strategy for Ericsson, there's four key pillars. The first, absolutely critical, empowering the individuals. As I said before, the individuals will be the core of your structure, and they need to see that they can freely express their ideas, freely engage with projects, create ad hoc teams, and share their uh, ideas, findings, and results with everybody else in their organization with minimal supervision. The second is breaking out of the hierarchical process the typical enterprise structure of management chain of command that limits employees from doing things on their own initiative and really taking control of a creative process that will drive an uh, enterprise forward. Third is looking at upgrading your, uh, look, upgrading your social networking tools, looking at social media, looking at wikis, looking at gamification, creating all these tools to really drive user engagement, really incentivize your employees to use the system and show that it's a collaborative and open system. And lastly, the thing that's driving all of this is an open ecosystem. As I mentioned in the problems area, you have to have an open ecosystem, otherwise your tools will break, they will not work, information will not flow freely, and your employees will abandon the solution. So let's take a look at how a potential use case for Ericsson will work out. Now let's look at a specific scenario, how Ericsson can utilize in this collaboration network to seize global opportunities. As we know, Ericsson in Croatia already deployed mobile healthcare solution to the hospitals, to the physicians. So let's look back at China, this growing mobile healthcare market. So with the local government support, we see that there's tremendous opportunities for the information communication technology companies. Think about if Ericsson utilizing their expertise from Croatia adapt to China markets, the company can seize the leadership of an organization positions in the new market, get market share, and also provide meaningful services to the billions of Chinese rural residents to help them to get access to the advanced, to the advanced healthcare services. But by adapting these knowledges and expertise, Ericsson need to consider about these key issues. First of all, the knowledge transferring costs across different business units, across different regions, across different countries. And also, Ericsson needs to think about how to help the consumers in China to adapt to this new mobile healthcare mindset, new technologies, new services. So, by leveraging the collaboration network, Ericsson can transfer this knowledge from Croatia to China markets efficiently. Now, let's look at the architecture of the collaboration network. So, as we see inside the company, we'll see that Ericsson China and Ericsson Croatia were utilizing the enterprise social network to create a both-way knowledge sharing and also so that the Ericsson China can get expertise from Croatia. On the other side, the, Chinese, the China market's best practice can enhance to help the Croatia markets to enhance their solution, to improve their solution services. And when we look at outside Ericsson, 
we will see the beauty of this model. So actually, the partners, the customers, are also actively engaged in this entire ecosystem for open innovation, for knowledge sharing. We will see that the partners are, for, are forming some virtual collaboration groups so that the physicians, they can share expertise. The hospitals, they will talk about operation experiences. And also, the telecom operators will integrate a global integrated solution to the consumers. So Ericsson collaboration network not only create value for the company itself, but also create value for the all, employ all players in the Intel ecosystem. We also quantified their financial benefits, bring, which was bring, brought by this collaboration network. According to our projection, over 300 US dollars, billion US dollars, will be saved by 2015. And uh, also, we look at the risks and uh, impediments of this solution. So this is a great opportunity for Ericsson to really establish itself at the forefront of a changing social network, social, uh, social society. And there are some risks and issues and mitigations to those, however. But if you look across the common thread of all the mitigation factors, the way that this ecosystem will be set up, if done right, can mitigate things like lack of part partner interests, geopolitical risk. It will be a decentralized global network. It will be leveraging multiple partners across the world. And by engaging those partners early, you can mitigate risks and set up the ecosystem for strong success. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for your attention. We look forward to discussing this with you further. Okay. Um, one question. Um, in slides eight and nine, we described uh, how we're going to earn money with the education system. Can we develop a little bit more the revenue streams and how it would work? Uh, sure. Um, if you want to select the appendix there. <coughs> So, so here's on the collaboration side. Are you talking about the collaboration side or the Cambodia side on the, the education the, side? The education side. Okay. Yeah. You have a slide on that too. You had a lot of dollars, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we did is we looked at the uh, Cambodian market, and first the consideration that we took into account was looking at it from what is the most cost-effective way to approach this market. It is not to go in and build out the infrastructure ourselves and spend all that capex in order to try to leverage a solution. It's to go into places that already have network coverage, that we can leverage those resources already. Ericsson, as a global operator and a global partner of a lot of the telecom operators in the region, can really leverage those relationships um, in order to establish a footprint, and not only with the carriers, but also with their ecosystem partners, Teachers Without Borders, for example, can provide a, uh, a channel partner for them to reach out to these communities. So looking at how we did the uh, revenue here, if you want to skip to the next slide, um, we have the revenue build up here where we assumed uh, the charge for one year of coursework per student is about $20. Uh, that's not going to be directly charged to the student, that could be a combination of Partly the student, partly uh, foundation uh, fundraising, and partly government subsidization. Um, looking at some of the demographic issues of how many school-aged children there are, the penetration rates, and um, getting to a total ecosystem revenue. Now what we take from this revenue number is a shared amount of costs. So there are deployment costs, you need to get somebody out there, you need to buy the equipment, you need to put it in, you need to train the people to use it. We use some estimates on the deployment costs. Um, to approximate those costs. Now those costs will be shared across the entire ecosystem because they benefit from the deployment of these services. Next, we go to this, what we call the ecosystem gross profit. And that is what's gonna be split among the various partners. Uh, we gave, uh, as the operator of the network, the enabler of the network, we gave Ericsson a 10% revenue distribution. Partners, as the owners of the content, the applications, government, hardware partners, whoever it may be, we gave them an 85% share to make sure that you know, the revenue is flowing through the ecosystem. 
And lastly, looking at the mobile network operator, while we did build in a fee structure for the continuing service, we thought that it would be appropriate to make sure that they are properly incentivized to continue to provide services to these rural regions. And so we gave them an additional 5% um, revenue share on top of their service fees. Now looking at how, how it works for Ericsson, um, so after they take the 10%, you start off very small. Obviously, this is a, a little bit of a smaller market. But looking at what the Ericsson revenue is on the line in the middle here, and then the Ericsson cost from uh, developing sales reps and vendor partnerships, and um, the average salary, we assume that there's going to be about 20 in the region, paid an average salary of $30,000, um, and said that Cambodia is going to you know, account for about 20% of their time and effort. So we allocated 20% of those costs to Ericsson. So you see that the Ericsson costs dropped down to about um, $219,000 in year one. And I think on the next slide, it continues on. Oh. No. But um, so by year three, with the addition of those costs against the kind of revenue share against Ericsson, they're negative in the first two years, but start turning positive. And the beauty of the model is that as you scale, as you leverage your sales reps across different uh, geographies, and as you leverage your partners, that's what we mentioned about nonlinear non revenue growth and kind of stable cost growth. Okay, thank you. Is that uh, millions of dollars? What, what, what is the... Oh, the unit on that? Yeah. Oh, that's actually in dollars. So, in I mean, dollars. It, it is, so as we mentioned, the Cambodian market is a little bit small, but we're talking about a very low ARPU. So they are going to be one of the lowest ARPU markets. So it's markets. $2 million approximately right. 2012. Right. right. So, I mean, but it's about getting the market penetration and showing that this model could work in a market that has such a uh, low, low ARPU. So the $333 million that was mentioned, is that... Is that for this case, or what so case is that? So the $333 million is on the collaboration side. On the collaboration side, okay. Um, so if you want to, there we go. Oh, there it is. So this is a uh, number of different factors. One more up is um, the model here. So looking at reduction in e-learning, e-help, and collaboration groups, the existing groups that, exi that are already trying to deploy these solutions, we think that with the ecosystem, they become an intermediary that doesn't really need to be standing in the way of collaboration with this kind of uh, network solution. Uh, reduction in employee turnover and cost, looking on both the factors of losing employees and how much it costs to replace them. Um, the stat that we dug up was about 150% of their salary for a year because of the loss of knowledge. But with our knowledge network and with the collaboration solution, that expertise resides in the network versus walking out the door with an employee. So we decided to take that, that actual cost down because they actually do leave some of their knowledge. Um, reduced the employee turnover rate because employees are more engaged with the company, they're, more, they're less likely to leave, and they feel like a more valued member of the company. And then reduction in support costs as you crowdsource, as you work with your partners, as you work with the customers, as you work with internal and external networks. You have this wide range of people that are using Ericsson solutions that, can, that have their own problems, that have had their own uh, solutions to those problems, that crowdsource the, the help. And no longer do people need to just call Ericsson and say, I have this problem. You have a community of users that say, oh, I've had this problem too. Let me tell you how we solved it in our, in our deployment. Can I ask a follow-up question on the open collaboration? Because I think that one of the stoppers is about security, as you mentioned. Uh, how would you go about solving that? Um, I think there's a number, of, uh, a number of ways that you can go about doing that. Uh, first, it's about governmental, it's about the institutional policies that drive your security measures. And it's about not just um, inside your organization, outside your organization. It's about within various tiers of your organization, there's different levels of information that should be shared, that shouldn't be shared. So a lot of it's policy driven. There can be partnerships with uh, security vendors in order to really enforce those if that's not a specialty that Ericsson can uh, you know, enable themselves. Maybe as a follow-up question, how, how did you get with the uh, di diagnosis of our issues in collaboration? <laughs> Pardon? How do you, did you get to the facts or the diagnosis of? Uh, I just. Of, oh, what the broad issues yes. in collaboration are? <laughs> I mean, I, I think they are similar to a lot of different industries that struggle with kind of fragmented solutions that are trying to bring all these solutions together. But you know, as you see in software, you see in hardware all the time, system integration costs just adds time, adds cost, and really you know, tanks uh, tanks the potential of an opportunity, mm -hmm. and especially with something that needs as. Uh, finely tuned communication networks and as free communication networks as possible, you really see those problems very, very close up front. 
Another question on the, on the Cambodia side. You seem to recommend us to change the go-to-market. We typically go to market via the operators. And here it seems to be a different model with some sales reps. Can you explain why you suggest this rather big change of strategy? So with this particular change in strategy, uh, we don't think it's necessarily a giant departure from what Ericsson is already doing. What we see in this is, is that the mobile network operators in Cambodia are relatively strong in terms of the fact that Cambodia was the first Asian nation to surpass a number of landlines with mobile phones back in 1993. So there's already a market of mobile network operators there. There's already a market of people that are clearly using these technologies there. Now, with er the Ericsson Empowered ecosystem, therein lies the difference of what we're trying to promote. We're trying to get Ericsson out there so that the people that are in the marketplace can see the good of a network society. They can look at Ericsson and really understand the value that's being created by this particular ecosystem. And we're trying to make sure that people understand that it's Ericsson that's empowering this ecosystem, no matter which mobile network operator they're a part of. And that's really key to the fundamental driving strategy of an Ericsson-empowered ecosystem. It gives Ericsson that ability to move out there and really promote the company well and really be able to drive new partnerships in areas that they haven't tapped at before. Uh, maybe one, uh, one, one more question about the uh, Cambodia. Mm -hmm. it, it, how can you actually scale that? Do you have any ideas on? Yeah, absolutely. So one of the things with regards to scale in Cambodia has to do with the way that the government actually runs. There's a high level of corruption in the government system with regards to education, with regards to the way that the money flows in through this, the system. What we see with the Ericsson Empowered System, as Jason mentioned, is that we can cut that particular player out and go direct to market and create a marketplace for students, for knowledge folks, for teachers to engage in learning without having to deal with some of the problems that they've dealt with in the past in terms of money from foundations being lost in the system, uh, money from the government being lost in the system. So for Ericsson to be able to scale this model, what we look at is starting off with a transactional based model where students can work uh, students and teachers can come together and develop the proper price uh, in terms of the demand and supply. Um, Ericsson and his partners will seed the content early on and there will be grant funded so that it's directly funding this particular opportunity and this particular market creation. As the market grows and as this knowledge market becomes bigger, what we see is a movement towards a more subscription based model where you've got content library, matru content library maturation where you don't need as many people developing content at one time, where you're not trying to get producers of content to continuously create things for some sort of external value, but rather the producers and the consumers have developed long-term relationships in this particular marketplace, and they see the value of participating in it. Not only for just creating things on demand and supply basis, but on the basis of the fact that they've developed a relationship. And this, we think, is the right way to scale this particular opportunity up to create a knowledge marketplace that's powered by Ericsson. Ask a question on competition. The Ericsson empowered ecosystem is competing against who? Are there any competitors out on the market? Think about the com competitors. Actually, we position that there are large uh, information communication technology companies which have a global scale, have a global blue, uh, blue, blueprint, but also already established their machine-to-machine -machine technology and also have their global customer relationship. So these companies. So we specifically with Cisco as a competitor with Ericsson because Cisco have the network back, backbone network established infrastructures and also it has tech the, the not, uh, developing country and also develop, uh, also developed countries. So, however, uh, think about these competitors. We think that Ericsson have its competitive advantage because Ericsson can leverage its leadership on mobile broadband and also its leadership on network services, on management services, also its global customer relationship with the global telecom operators. So leveraging this leadership, Ericsson can provide or impact actually is empowered, empowered the uh, entire ecosystem, not only just the focus on technology solution, but also the services, but also the open innovations, but also the platforms to 
create an entire ecosystem. This is the difference. What is the role of device providers? I mean, I noticed in your income statement you got $20 per terminal. What kind of terminal do you get for $20 that you can use for education? So for the education marketplace, there's a couple of areas that we looked into. There's the PC as a service that we looked into as a possible model. The other area that we looked into specific for Cambodia is one laptop per child. And since the first um, buy one, get one model that they released, Cambodia has actually received over 3,300 laptops from the one laptop per child foundation. And that's actually an area that we can utilize leveraging partners that develop these low cost mobile terminal solutions to access the internet to enable these terminals for low cost areas. So we see partners in both the nonprofit space in terms of the One Laptop Per Child Foundation, similar services, as well as existing things that are out there in the marketplace, such as PC as a service, which Ericsson does support. Thank you. Thank you.